for client side templating, I like pure, which unlike handlebars and mustache uses CSS selectors instead of using uh, the, the, what I call stupid PHP style bracket notation. Cause <laughs> if I wanted to use PHP, I just used flipping PHP, but I don't cause I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Component One, makers of Widgmo. If you need stunning UI elements or awesome graphs and charts, then go to widgmo.com and check them out. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 21 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have AJ O'Neill. Coming at you live from the deserts of Orem, Utah. Deserts? I grew up in those deserts. We, we also have... Joe Eames. Coming at you pre-recorded from a dirty basement. Dirty basement. I like I like dirty basements. You you should see ours. We have a quote crawl space on our house. And uh, it's a crawl space that I can stand up in and not worry about banging my head on the ceiling. That's quite the crawl space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've thought about uh, digging it down, um, pouring some concrete and actually building out a basement down there because there is plenty of room and it wouldn't take a ton of work. But uh I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and uh, this week we're going to be talking about weapons of choice, uh, just the the tools that we use to manage our JavaScript, kind of wrangle it and get it in line. Um, So I'm a little curious. It seems like the thing that drives the most uh, debate about weapons of choice is usually the text editor or IDE that people use. People get the most opinionated about that. What are you guys using? So I use Vim with Syntastic and JS Hint in I term. Okay. Wow. How about you, Joe? Um, so I use a lot of uh, Notepad++, but I will occasionally, because I'm working on .NET projects, end up uh, working inside of Visual Studio. Uh, in the past, I've used WebStorm. I really like that. WebStorm? I don't know if I've heard of that one. Oh, uh, it's uh, JetBrains uh, Web IDE. It's really fantastic. Okay, cool. So, oh, t- yeah. we don't have Tim to talk about uh, Cloud9. Cloud9, yeah. Yeah, we should spend a whole episode on that. Oh, wait, we did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I tend to use Vim. I like the Janus plugins. Um, it's just a set of plugins for Vim. Um, there are a few things that uh, I've looked at, but I haven't really customized it all that much. Um, I'm planning on picking up a book on Vim and just reading through it and learning all the stuff that I don't know about it. But I started out as a sysadmin and you can pretty much always count on some variant of VI being on the machine that you're on. So it it just made a lot of sense for me to kind of learn it. And um, once I had the basics down on it, then from there it, you know, it was just kind of a natural thing for me. I do want to point out that I have used Emacs um, and and I actually really like Emacs, but uh, it doesn't, I don't know. I, I just have a lot of muscle memory for Vim, and so that's kind of the way I went. But, you know, Emacs is definitely a viable alternative. So I just wanted to say that I I am the slowest Vim learner ever, okay? Every time we hire somebody new and get them started up with Vim, within a couple days they're teaching me stuff, right? Because there's, <laughs> there's so much to Vim, and everybody's got something particular, like... Uh, they they want to be able to see the line numbers or they want it to jump ahead so many lines or they want it to have a certain type of syntax highlighting or folding, you know. So, like, every person has something that's most important to them and they figure out how to do that. And um, I found that, like, the very basic, basic, basics, just using HJKL, um, since I've started doing that, which took me, like, two years of using Vim to finally do that instead of the arrow keys, but uh, a lot better for my wrists. Just an FYI. I always thought you were a little slow. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. <Jack. laughs> so, um, so why don't why don't you talk to us a little bit, Joe, about what maybe Visual Studio or WebStorm give you that that some of these basic text editors don't, and then we can talk about some of the plugins that do some of the same things or something like that. Okay. So, um, 
One of the things that really annoys me about using Visual Studio is I have yet to find um, a linter that works uh, for Visual Studio. So that's a real big annoyance. So starting off with the drawbacks. Um, but another thing you absolutely need if you're going to do JavaScript inside of Visual Studio is one of the plugins that will handle uh, high, uh, the outlining in JavaScript. You know, it, that's outlining and collapsing is just an absolute must, at least for me when I'm working. I can't deal with, without it. I, more than a screen height of code, and I need to have some outlining so I can collapse things up and notice that. So if you're working in Visual Studio and you don't have an outliner, that's one of the, and it's easy to find Google for it. It's absolutely um, essential. But the benefits, I think, of using Visual Studio over, say, just a plain Jane text editor is that Visual Studio has really made in this most recent version, Visual, 2010, uh, Visual Studio 2010, and uh, I assume they'll keep it up with uh, the new version that's going to be coming out here soon, is the IntelliSense that's actually looking at the JavaScript and actually giving you some fairly reasonable choices. Um, I'd say about only 40% of the time am I annoyed by choices that don't make any sense in, in the uh, IntelliSense. So just a little bit better than half the time, which for me is actually worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like, you know, it does a pretty good job looking at the JavaScript and understanding it and actually giving you um, choices. And then refactoring is another nice thing where it'll actually, you can change variable names and you can extract variables and... Um, that's, it's really nice to have access to those sorts of features, which is identical. Th- that refactoring actually is through uh, the ReSharper plugin. And so if you use WebStorm, you know, the features there are actually really similar. So using when I went to WebStorm and started using WebStorm, it felt a lot like I was using Visual Studio. I got a lot of the same IntelliSense. The IntelliSense was really similar. And the refactoring that was available was actually really similar in WebStorm. So I really liked um, and felt comfortable in WebStorm once I when I went to it, but I recently was watching some video of somebody doing some stuff in Angular um, with WebStorm, and uh, after watching that, I realized I knew WebStorm like not at all. This guy had his WebStorm so well configured and set up, and doing things I had no idea you could do in WebStorm. So I was really impressed with that, and made me want to go back and try WebStorm out again. Um, so I was really impressed with that. So that's, I think, the, probably the, the one benefit is the IntelliSense and refactoring. I guess too, that's two benefits, right? Yeah, a lot of the IDEs have that kind of stuff. Um, I know that JetBrains isn't ReSharper their C-sharp editor. Yeah. And then um, they have RubyMine, which is their Ruby editor, and it has a lot of the same JavaScript, coffee script stuff <laughs> shipped with it. <laughs> it. It has a lot of the same stuff, you know, the the refactoring stuff and the... Um, the IntelliSense. And one thing I noticed is that in the past when I was trying to use it, um, it was actually a little bit slow. So if you if you were typing something out and it decided that it needed to do the IntelliSense um, to help you fill in whatever, your your whole IDE would hang. And, mm. and you'd have to wait until it figured out what all the possibilities were and then it would give them to you. The nice thing is, is that now they've fixed that and so it, it's actually reasonably fast and and works pretty well most of the time. So I've been you pretty know, happy with, with what JetBrains has put out. It seems to me like JetBrains products are very cyclical. They'll come out with a version that's really slow. You know, ReSharp is a plug-in for Visual Studio, and so they'll come out with a version that's really slow, really dogging down Visual Studio, and then the next minor revision of it will speed it back up again. Uh, so it seems to me like even though they produce, in my opinion, some of the best developer uh, tools out there, that they have, they constantly have a problem with keeping performance up. Right, but at the same time, I mean, some of the stuff that they have is just awesome. So. Oh yeah, I could, I could, def, I would never do C sharp development without ReSharper. Never. Yeah. So, so you kind of have that. Um, and uh, AJ, you mentioned that you were using some kind of Lint plugin for JavaScript. Yeah. So Syntastic is I, I think you gotta have pathogen installed for it because with them like pathogen is basically the module loader because whatever they built in isn't modular enough for most people um, so syntastic is just something on github where you basically uh, git clone it and then it goes into your dot 
Vim directory, and it automatically comes with a lot of stuff for different languages. And for JavaScript, if you have either JS Hint or JS Lint already installed, then as soon as you go to colon W to write save the file, it will refresh based on whatever options you have. Uh, so at the top of a, of a file, you can put a block comment, so slash star JS Hint or JS Lint, and then things like evil true if you want to allow eval. Um, which you shouldn't, and I don't know why I even said that, or um, or <laughs> lax comma or lax break so that you can you can do comma first if you do that style, or you can concatenate strings with the plus operator on multiple lines. So it, it knows, you, you give it some of these flags to tell it about your style, and those are found on the JS hint and the JS lint documentation. And then uh, it gives you little red squigglies, like like uh, spelling error type squiggly things underneath of whatever lines have syntax errors on them or style errors on them or uh, in certain cases logic errors like if i equals um, zero for example would be a logic error because it needs to be if i equals equals or equals 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 zero um, so stuff like that and we have recently made it a policy that everybody should be using one of these types of tools here because I can't tell you how many times I've opened up somebody else's code and found an error in their code that maybe hasn't yet affected us, but it's just a really simple error that Syntastic plus JS Hint will catch pretty quickly. And, awesome. Uh, so, so, you're, so you're using JS Hint at work? Yeah. Um, now, are there different variations on the different lints or linters or whatever the, the different styles that they're linting for so JS lint is very strict oh wow the page port just got a major update um, and you know Crockford is he's a very opinionated guy and that's that's a great thing it's always good to have a leader a strong leader rather than a weak leader um, so some of his options are called things like stupidity. So if you ever use a sync function, like read file sync in Node.js, if you don't have the stupidity option checked, then it will complain at you. And the difference between JS lint and JS hint um, is the, the strictness of the linter. JS lint is exactly Crockford style. If you if you want your white space differently than his style, then either you have to go and make sure that option is explicitly unchecked, or last time I tried to do comma first, I couldn't do it in JS Lint, and that's why I switched to JS Hint. Um, so they they just have a different array of options for what's considered bad style or. Um, bad syntax. Right. And, and you prefer JS Hint? Uh, right now, yeah. I could see myself going back to JS Lint if he would allow um, comma first. Because I think his uh, the JS Lint is, by default, um, it is very strict. Whereas JS Hint, by default, is is a little more lax, it seems. So there's some things you have to go and turn on manually. So I have a little bash file that's mkjs that I put in user local bin. And every time I run that file and give it a file name, it pre-populates it with um, my JS hint parameters and then a function closure and then a strict statement so that I get rid of some of that boilerplate. Cool, makes sense. So, so basically, it's configurable stupidity in the JS hint. It starts out saving you from the most stupid stuff, and then you can uh, configure it from there and say, "I want these other options to, you know, enforce these other style uh, uh, positions or style. What do you call them? Style preferences." Yeah. 
That makes sense. And and I think I remember on the JS Lint page, you can actually, and I, I don't know about the JS Hint um, page, but you can actually put code in, tell it which options you really care about, and then it'll actually lint it on the page for you. But but I like the idea of when you try and save it to have it lint your stuff. Yeah. So all you have to do is npm install dash g js hint and or js lint and uh, whichever you know flavor you you like most and then just make sure that in every time you start a javascript file just put in the your standard header for what options you like on and off. Right, makes sense. So um what what other tools do you guys use for your JavaScript stuff? I mean, if you're if you're writing things in Node or anything else, are there other tools that kind of give you a good um, feel for your code quality or help you make sure that it, it does what it's supposed to do? Um, one of the things that I think should definitely be mentioned as an important tool in the toolbox is uh, um, Canary. Uh, that's Chrome Canary, right? Yeah, Chrome Canary. Absolutely. I mean, all the additional features that you get with it, the uh, uh, new stuff, that's an absolute must. I've I've recently been doing a lot more in Canary and really found a lot of benefit out of it. Yeah, I, I really like it too. It It's my browser of choice. I mean, sometimes uh, you get a little bit funky stuff going on, but, uh, you know, it, it definitely works pretty well. Yeah. Um, I've been recently doing an Angular uh, JS application, and there's an Angular plugin for Canary that makes it really nice for debugging. Yeah. Um, so it, it has all the built-in tools that are really nice, the debuggers and stuff. Have you found that you've had to debug things in other browsers like um, Internet Explorer or Firefox or Safari? Uh, at least for me, I spend as little time as possible in Internet Explorer. I don't know why. It feels like Firefox's uh, debugger tools and Chrome's uh, or Firefox's developer tools and Chrome's developer tools are very analogous. You know, when you're in one and you go to the next, the other one, you don't have to um, learn tons of new stuff. Maybe things are positioned slightly differently, but they just kind of feel like the same paradigm. But Internet Explorer, is, it's like. You know, we kind of that same Microsoft thing. We see that everybody else is doing it. We have to do it, but we have to do it really different so everybody knows it's us. Yeah, I, I generally like if you're going to do things in Firefox that you use Firebug. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I've, I've just used the built-in tools when dealing with Internet Explorer, and I've had to do that a few times um, just because there was something funny or weird with Firebug. Um, but, uh, yeah, with Safari and... Um, Chrome, I, I just use whatever they have in the in the browser, and Chrome's tools are just amazing. They're just incredible. So, um, so do you prefer Chrome over Firefox, uh, Firebug? Yes, absolutely. I mean, so, there's just so much there. I don't know. I'm a little funny. I, I used Firebug for a long time before I started using Chrome heavily uh, for JavaScript development debugging, and I still feel a little more comfortable with Firebug. Even though I don't like how slow my Firefox gets uh, compared to Chrome, I still feel a little more comfortable in Firebug. Yeah, I can kind of see that. I mean, there are a few things where something I've used for a long time, um, the way I think about problems kind of lend themselves more to that tool as, you know, moving forward, even if I change tools and change approaches. So I, I guess I could kind of see that. And there, there's definitely a lot there in Firebug that you can do, so. Yeah. And, and they're consistently adding more features and making it better. So, you know, when the there was a Fire Finder um, add-in, and it hasn't been working for quite a while. But when it was working, I used that all the time, especially for CSS. If I was doing any CSS work, uh, like CSS debugging and fixing, um, but that fire that plugin was awesome, and I haven't seen anything analogous in Chrome or uh, in IE. Yeah, it looks like. I just looked it up. It looks like uh, it's it works with Firefox 3.5 through 14.0. And I'll, I'll get a link to that in the show notes as well. But yeah, it, it looks really interesting. Um, so the other question I have, because we're talking about weapons of choice, is when you're building a web page, what what libraries do you tend to include? 
So I've got kind of a, a standard set, which is probably a little bit different from um, what most people have. I, I started building a, a tool set called Steve Tools. And I'm actually just going to, uh, when, when, I, when I run Steve init, it just basically gives me a directory with browser, server, package.json, and like all my common stuff already done and then some JS files already there with my my JS hints and, and all that. So uh, just give me a second, I'm gonna open up this package.json and tell you what I've got here. Um, so for node development, um, most common modules that I use are connect um, a bunch of connect plugins um, for each async and sequence which I wrote um, I use all the time they're the most useful of the the uh, asynchronous functions that I have um, then for for actually building the application I use Jade and less Uglify JS, which I'd actually like to be using Google's Closure compiler, but Uglify, uh, when I looked, first looked at the documentation, was just a lot simpler, and I haven't gone back to to use that instead. And then I have a tool that's similar to Browserify called Pack Manager, and so I I use that as well to package all the different JSON files into one. And let me see if there's anything else. For client-side templating, I like Pure, which, unlike Handlebars and Mustache, uses CSS selectors instead of using uh, the, the what I call stupid PHP-style bracket notation. Because <laughs> if I wanted to use PHP, I just used flipping PHP, but I don't because I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and then instead of jQuery, I actually use Ender, but it's very, very similar. It's it's the same API. It's just um, you can get chunks of it. So if you don't want all of jQuery, you can just get a few different parts of Ender. Um, so, but I I sometimes use jQuery too. I, they're kind of interchangeable for me. Right. Hmm. Interesting. How about you, Joe? If you're going to build a, a website or web front end, what, you know, what's your kind of attack plan? Well, so my baseline for anything is jQuery and underscore. I start out there always. And then um, I usually i am going to use uh, some kind of, this is, of course, website development. I'm going to use some kind of an MVC framework. So unfortunately, you know, uh, I kind of feel like each of the, uh, major MVC frameworks, the most popular ones that are out there, they all have their advantages, but they all have some fairly significant drawbacks. So I go back and forth between which of which of them I prefer to use. Right now we're doing Angular. Tried Ember, had some problems with that because testability. Um, doing a new one, starting a new one in Backbone. So one of those. Um, and then uh, after that, I don't know. It, it, for me, I don't have a, a default set as soon as I hit that point. Of course, uh, try to use a, usually use requires, but uh, I'm kind of plain, I guess. Nothing <laughs> nothing fancy like AJ. AJ's got all these uh, really cool ones. He's living on the edge. Yep. Now, do you do much node development? No, I don't do any node development. I mean, yeah, okay. So I, I've played with it a little, but I really haven't done a lot either. And if I'm dealing with uh, JavaScript, usually I'm using CoffeeScript. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll pull in jQuery. Usually I'll bring in Backbone, which includes underscore. Um, and and that's, that's the basic level that I hit. Um, I don't use less or any JavaScript libraries for my CSS. Um, I, I tend to lean more towards SAS or SCSS. And so um, I like the, what like Twitter Bootstrap and some of the other ones give you. But I'll just find a, a variation that somebody's made that fits into my CSS um, deal. So I'm not using uh, JavaScript for any of that. If I'm 
if I'm dealing with uh, JavaScript templates, if I if I have the case for it, because sometimes it, it takes way less time to just put something together in in Rails and then um, have it kind of ship it up to the the DOM or ship it up through Ajax. Um, you know, so unless I have a, a really good case for it, I usually don't use templates, JavaScript templates. Um, but if if I have like repeatable um, sections of code that all need events and stuff like that, then then I'll usually use Handlebars JS, um, which is something that I really enjoy using. Uh, it's nice because it gets out of your way and it's it's mostly logicless. So you know you just bind it to whatever you're you're using and then uh, or whatever object. Um, it's representing, and then you just put it together like that. Um, but but I really want to dig in and try some of the other frameworks like Knockout and uh, and Ember. I just I just haven't had the time. It's kind of tricky to to figure all that out. But Backbone's kind of my weapon of choice when it comes to the MVC frameworks. So even though you do Backbone, uh, are you not uh, typically using underscores uh, templating? Um, I used it once. That those are the the JST stuff that I think. Um, um no, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Isn't no. it? It's just a. It's kind of a an angle bracket type syntax where you can change what the things are. You can use the dirt, double cur- curly quotes if you want, or curly braces if you want. But it's uh, it's fairly it's really minimal. It's a really minimal uh, templating language. It kind of feels like a. Uh, handlebars without just pared down. Huh. I'll have to look at it. I, I don't think I've used that then. Um, there's a JST, which is a JavaScript templates engine that uh, it, it felt kind of like ERB in, in Ruby to me. And uh, it was okay, but it just I, 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 didn't, I really just didn't feel like it uh, gave me everything I need. It was kind of it, it had more features than I really wanted it to have, and uh, when I started looking at handlebars, it just seemed like the way to go because I could, I could set up the templates and, and you know, it was really relatively simple in the way that it allowed me to interact with my objects. So, um, but I'll have to look into underscore templates and see what's there. Um, I do really like underscore though, as far as all of the different collection. Um, collection, what do you call them, collection functions Manip- and things like that. Manipulation, that yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's really nice. You, you can get around a lot of things by doing that. It is. Underscore is a great, and it's underused. Uh, more people should definitely be using underscore. It just makes your, it's like, J, like jQuery, it makes your JavaScript just a lot nicer. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, there's actually a fork off of underscore called Lodash, and um, some people, they, what I feel stupidly argue against underscore, and I don't use it as much as I should either. But they say, oh well, it has so much in it, and all I need is just the pluck function, which I mean a lot of times it's true. And Lodash actually has a build tool where you can tell it to exclude certain things or mm-hmm. to include them, and so you can get a smaller build. And it also, um, I don't, I don't know. It's, um, what is it, John David Dalton? I think I got his name right. I met him once at the, the conference. But so he, he has got a personal vendetta or something against the, the underscore guy. And so he goes <laughs> and he fixes all of the bugs. Any bug that shows up in underscore on the issues page, he fixes it. And then he puts it in Lodash. And then um, marks it on his site here, and um, Jeremy doesn't take any of his commits, from what I understand. So if he fixes a bug, Jeremy won't take it just on the fact that it's him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny, funny. That's too funny. So it, it's it's an interesting rivalry, but it, it looks like a pretty good. Um, Alternative, if you want something that can be a little bit lighter weight, yeah, hmm. and that so, has all the bug fixes. So coming from the .NET world, I'm very used to. Uh, I've used Link for a long time, which is very similar, actually, to Underscore. You know, it's a Link's a collection manipulation uh, DSL, uh, just like Underscore is. And one of the things that I found surprising is how many uh, features 
are kind of I feel like are missing from underscore that are available in link and nobody's bothered to put them in there. Things like uh, you know it has its like first function so you can grab the first element of a list, but it doesn't take a filter uh, inside of it so that you can grab the first thing that matches a particular filter. Mm-hmm. Now is link a .NET library or is it another yeah. JavaScript library? Link's a .NET library, so it's only available inside .NET. That's the L I N Q. Yeah. Yep. So I think there's a I, I look at I started using underscore and I it's immediately felt natural to me as a .NET developer because it was so similar to Link. But then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do dot first. I'm gonna pass in a filter function. And it just didn't work because I was so used to it in Link and I went to try to go and do it in underscore and it didn't work. And they just felt like such analogous tools. Well, uh, couldn't you do a dot filter and then a dot first? Yeah, you can. Which you but can do the same thing in Link, but that's kind of the point. In Link, it's uh, you know the it actually fits right into the dot first, and it just feels very natural. Well, uh, do this. Go to the Lodash page, create an issue about it, or better yet, go to the <laughs> underscore page, create an issue about it, and then see it in Lodash a week later. Right. Oh wow. <laughs> I love these programmer rivalries. So something else you said, AJ, kind of brings us to an, into another set of tools, and that's build tools. Just because you mentioned that you can customize, you know, which parts of Lodash go into your your build, uh, so you can get a smaller build. What what build tools do you guys use for your JavaScript? So I I did want to make a note on less. That's CSS. But the reason that I I go with less is because all you have to do is take a CSS file, rename it to dot less and then start progressively enhancing your CSS. So question AJ, what, what about stylus? Uh, stylus I haven't used. I've heard talk about it but you know sometimes it's just because the tool I come up with first is the tool I end up using but I am open to hearing about it. Tell me about it. Well I don't know tons about it. It's not available uh, for Windows development so you can't use it, but um, I was looking through. Uh, we had some. We had a project that just had crazy CSS. And we had to get a handle on it, and so I was looking at what alternatives are available for .NET, and less is available. Uh, as is, um, uh, crap. I can't remember the the other one that's really popular besides less. SAS. Uh, SAS. Yep. Less. They're both available for .NET, but. So I saw Stylus when I was looking around and just read through their front page and their documentation where they were showing the features and it was like, wow, it was, it was like less plus a whole bunch of stuff. Was, you know, was what little bit I got out of it. It was really impressive, but just, it's just not available for .NET. Mm. This looks very similar to me to what less is, except that they've combined less with CoffeeScript, kind of. Huh. Yeah, uh, to it, me it, it looks don't. a lot like SAS, except there are a couple of minor differences. So, so it looks like it it would be less compatible if you were doing less and you started using Stylus. Just from these examples here, if you're not using any of the Ninja features of Less, which I guess is kind of why you use Less. The reason I actually started using Less was just to lint the CSS to make sure it was valid because. You know, somebody get in there and forget to add a bracket, and of course the browser doesn't tell you about an error that you have in your syntax and your CSS. It just keeps chugging along. So right. originally, it was we we used it as a lint tool for the CSS, not because of its features. And then we started using its features gradually. Huh. So something just occurred to me, which is kind of a little bit of backtrack, but with Lodash, you know, Backbone requires underscore. Can you use Lodash instead? You should be able to. It's API compatible. Huh. That's really cool. Yeah, are the two namespaces the same, though? Yeah. Well, they, they're just a, the underscore. Oh, you know, okay. They're all off the underscore, so as long as they have the same API built off the underscore, uh, then, yeah, that would work. Huh, interesting. But but then you would have to use either the full Lodash library or at least the, the functions that backbone depends on so right you have to figure out what backbone depends on so that I actually had another question especially for you aj it seems like you really like these tools that you you are gravitate towards the ones that allow you to pick and choose you know use a build for the library and pick and choose just the features that you want do you ever i I'm, i've seen a lot of that i back in the day i used yui which had that um 
feature into it and I didn't run into this at that time but now it seems like I might more do you, do you ever feel like you're in there using a the tool and all of a sudden there's features that you want to use that you didn't include in the original build going through and rebuilding it out to include the features that you want is just a hassle so you end up not using some little feature that you might have used and then you, that could ha- might happen over and over and over again and you didn't realize that if you'd done it from the beginning just grab that feature in the first time you wanted it I don't know do you ever, do you ever get that situation? Uh, no, I don't really feel like it's a problem. Um, I mean, the build process is just something I'm, I expect because like a lot of people, they don't like the, they, they don't like build processes. The more work the build process has, the, the worse it is. But to me, the build process is justified by the benefits primarily of linting, um, we don't have any bad CSS because we use less. If there's a syntax error, it doesn't build. We don't have any HTML errors because we use Jade, which uses a CSS style syntax instead of a bracket syntax. Um, so we use Jade that compiles to clean, valid HTML, so we don't have any errors there. Um, we use a JavaScript packer, um, well, it Two phase one that concatenates the files, which is the thing I wrote, the Pac-Man Pac Manager, and then we use Uglify. So if there's any sort of syntax error in the JavaScript that wasn't for some reason we ignored the linter as we you know saved and closed, um, again it won't build. So I love having things not build if they don't work. So yeah. that's that's always more worth it to me than the convenience of of not having to enter in a, another name in, a, in a, an array list of things to include. So that's that's actually really cool And but I actually meant to ask a different question. <laughs> 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 I was talking actually like uh, tools like Lodash where you go in and you build, you, you get a build of Lodash that only includes just the pieces that you want, right? Yeah, so I, my answer is still kind of the same in that it doesn't like the build process doesn't bother me. It's, gotcha. It, it's, it does, if you start using Lodash and you've only you're only using a couple features, there's another feature you want to use and you didn't put it in the build. You go back to Lodash, you get a new build from them that has the feature that you want. That doesn't bother you doing that cycle. Well, and typically because I don't work with like gigantic sites, I don't actually care that much about the size of things, I'm okay with including it, but I like the idea that if I want to optimize it later, I can. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll err more on the side of including things I don't need. Gotcha. Well, that that seems funny because you 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 like Lodash, which there's underscore, but you like you like Lodash specifically because you can build to it. But you're not you're saying that you by default you don't actually take advantage of that. You just like having that feature available to you if you want it. Yeah. And then same thing with um, Ender. Like, I actually don't use a lot of the features of Ender, but then I just have some standard ones that I just pull in, and maybe I use them, maybe I don't. But it's just, I don't know, it's that mental thing. So this brings me to a gripe I have about the uh, JavaScript in dis- you know development uh, environment as a whole. Uh, I don't know exactly how to describe uh, the JavaScript ecosystem. And that is that there are not enough of these libraries out on CDNs so that you can feel less guilty about including them you know, in their full size on your sites. And by CDNs, I don't mean some little crappy out in the corner CDN that you know, has less than one, one thousandth of one percent. I'm talking about like Google. I, I well, prefer... I think that you're right. I also think that we're, we're kind of at the tipping point, if you will, uh, where it's something that's definitely doable. NPM has gre- gained such great popularity. Um, I, it would be really cool to see a CDN that just pulls in from NPM. And if your package.json specifies well enough uh, either how you build the library or, or whatever, that it just yanks it in. That's a really interesting idea. Hopefully somebody yeah. does. You know, and maybe my my frustration, my anger, really is directed specifically at Google, because their API, their their CDN only has something like ten different JavaScript libraries on there. They have jQuery and jQuery UI, which I will only use them off of Google CDN because of how widespread that is. But all the other ones, you know, Angular, 
Backbone, etc. I feel like they should be up there on Google's CDN, and most of them aren't. So um, I'm going to interrupt things here really quickly. Um, AJ said he has to leave pretty soon. So why don't you give us your picks, and then you can just drop off when you need to. Okay. So for picks, one, I'm listening to The Tipping Point, um, and it's a pretty interesting book. That's by Malcolm Gladwell, right? Yeah. Uh, And then I got a recommendation to read Outliers right after that, or I'll probably just get the audio book because... I can listen to it at work. Um, uh, Also, I'm going to pick Amazon Prime because when I choose two-day shipping, I'm finding more and more often that they're actually getting it to me next day. Yeah, I've noticed that too. um, And when I pick next, I've picked next day on a few occasions and it's actually going overnight. So it comes next day in the morning. Um, So I'm... And, and I hear they have a secret plan to make that the, the standard uh, at some point in the near future. And then um, Arduino. I started hacking a little bit with Arduino, and it's just it's way fun just to get dust blinking lights going, you know? Um, other than that, there was somebody uh, on, the, on the user voice, one of the, the questions in the weapons of choice was what do you what do you program to with music or headphones and I say I like to wear headphones um, because it helps me to be less distracted and I particularly like listening to Mario, Zelda and Final Fantasy remixes because <laughs> it's just so iconic <laughs> that's awesome so I'll listen on Spotify to that stuff and gets me in the mood makes me feel important Powered, powered up, ready to program. Awesome. All right. Well, um, let's see. Is er, So you said that people were asking what music and stuff that we listen to while we program? Yeah, that was in the user voice thing, the second half of the paragraph. Uh, abstract topics like merits of adjustable high desks, noise-canceling headphones, and your favorite playlist to code to. Okay, so um, let's talk about music for a minute then. Um, Joe, do you listen to music or anything while you code? Yeah, so um, I've been contracting with Pluralsight for a couple of months, and they're a 100% pair um, shop. So I actually haven't been listening to music hardly at all for the last month, month and a half. But when I do uh, code on my own and listen to music, I actually took, I can't remember whose, whose pick it was a couple of weeks ago, but it was uh, Russian, uh, Russian Waves. I it was probably Jameson's pick. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of the band now. But uh, I I really like programming to them. Uh, programming to the Star Wars soundtrack. And then if it's not that, it's kind of like uh, heavy metal where I can't hear the lyrics and can't understand the lyrics. So... <laughs> I like that 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 too. I tend to I like stuff that's a little bit more upbeat. So, like the star even the Star Wars soundtrack will be just a little bit too slow, and I'll switch over to something a little bit more upbeat. It was Russian circles. Russian James, circles. James, there James you go. Pick. So I'm a weirdo, and I don't actually listen to music all the time when I code. I actually listen to podcasts. So uh, that is weird. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of funny because a lot of people are like, "Well, how can you listen to a podcast and code at the same time?" And I I don't know. I just I just do, and so a lot of times I'm not like fully engaged listening. I'm just kind of letting it wash past me, and we you know we kind of you know I just kind of pick up things as 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 I go. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoy the podcasts, and so there are quite a few of them that I listen to. Um, some of them are fun, some of them are informative, some of them are technical. And so, um, it just, you know, it's just kind of my thing and that, that's what I do when I'm listening. And what I do is I actually have a pair of speakers that are sitting on my desk and they're like $5 speakers. They're HP speakers. I'm not even sure where I got them. Um, but I just plug my iPod into them and then I have my iPod plugged into my computer. And then, um, as, as I listen to a podcast, I'll just, um, you know, take it out of the playlist and, and put something else in. So, um, yeah, so kind of weird there. 
if if I'm out and about, then I just use the cheap uh, earbuds that I got from um, from Walmart, and so I just get the ten dollar earbuds. So, because because I'm pretty hard on stuff, and so if I destroy ten dollar earbuds, I, I don't cry over it. I just go get another pair. Um, but sometimes I wind up going and working out in the uh, at a restaurant or a cafe or something. And when I do that, I need the headphones so that I can listen to things and, and, and manage things that way. And so that's what I do. And then I just have a, I have an old white MacBook that I want to replace, um, that, uh, I, I use when I'm out and about. Hmm. So I have a confession, a related confession to make then, uh, occasionally I will actually watch soccer while I'm programming rather than listening to something else. I could see that. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing, you know, it's not very action, there's not action all the time, so I can just let it wash over me, and then when something interesting happens, I can divert my attention. Uh, But I only, I rarely do that, and I only do it when I'm doing certain types of programming, so if I start getting into the zone, I'll actually turn it off, and turn Mm -hmm. music back on, and and really just code, but if I'm like doing configuration or something like that. Yeah, did you watch that devastating soccer match on Saturday? I did not. I was out of town. Thankfully, I didn't have to endure it. Oh, geez. Yeah, it, it got to the point there where there was like 10 or 15 minutes left in regulation, and RSL was down by five goals, and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to skip along, and if somebody scores a goal, then I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, that was sad. It was pretty sad. And, and I'm not going to go into my opinions on some of the things that went down during that game. But anyway. Wrong podcast for that. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I, I could definitely see that coding to soccer. So, uh, yeah, and then what were the other things that they were asking as far as desks go? I mean, I've got this kind of... It's basically a cubicle that I that I work at in my house. It's in my house, um, which is kind of funny. A lot of people laugh because um, I really never worked in a cubicle until I was self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, I got a lot of desk space and stuff. Um, I've been tempted to try a standing desk, but I just I, I never have. Um, we talked a lot about this on the Ruby Freelancer show, and so if you want to kind of listen to that and, and hear us talk about our our different configurations, you can do that. Some of the guys have standing desks and things, and talk about what they like and don't like about it. Um, Are any of them named Dwight Schrute? No. <laughs> that seems love, like a Dwight Schrute thing. I love The Office. Oh my gosh! Yeah, didn't didn't he have like the the super mega desk or something where he he took uh, Jim's desk and Pam's desk and then put his desk on top of it and was standing up <laughs> working working at him, his desk or something. I remember him standing up at one point. I don't remember the stacking the desks, but I do remember him standing up at one point. Yeah. So, yeah, all the antics on that show are just hilarious. If you've ever worked in an office environment, especially a dysfunctional one, that show is so funny. (laughs) And and I've worked in my share of dysfunctional ones. So I got to go right now. But uh, just a note on that video game music real quick. Um, Zelda Reorchestrated and OCR.Rainwave.cc if you want to listen to good game music. Okay, cool. We'll get those into the show notes as well. Um, anyway, I, I don't know that there are any other things that we have to, to put in here. What do you use for, um, continuous integration, Joe? So I mostly use team city. Um, I, I really feel like in a windows environment, it's kind of best of breed. I, I can, I, one thing to say for the four, uh, .NET developers out there listening to JavaScript Jabber. <laughs> <laughs> is if you're using TFS, it's time to switch or change jobs. TFS? What's yeah, TFS? Yeah, that's Microsoft's uh, CI server slash testing framework. Slash, it's basically a superset of Visual Studio. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah my so, friends over at JetBrains will be happy to hear you say that. Yeah, definitely Team City. Jenkins, uh, just a tiny, worked just a tiny bit with, but... I, um, so I don't know too much about it. It seems like a really decent one, but I really like Team City. It's easy to go and it's free for um, projects that are small. Which is, it's funny how big a project can be. Like I've worked at corporations that had like thirty developers, and still Team City's free edition was actually plenty for what we needed. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So I actually use Jenkins as my preferred um, CI setup. 
I've also used Cruise Control, which uh, I'm trying to remember. I think Thoughtbot or somebody put that one out. Right. And uh, Cruise Control is is fine. It kind of um, it kind of expects you to do a little bit more setup than say something like Jenkins. Um, I haven't actually used um, Team City, so I don't know how to compare them, but. Um, Jenkins is pretty nice. It has a lot of plugins that allow you to do a lot of things with it. Um, and it works well with all different kinds of build setups. So, um, you know, if you have to build it and then test it or build it and then deploy it or anything like that, um, it has all that stuff built in. Um, most of what I'm testing with it is, is Ruby. And so, you know, I just get all the Ruby plugins for Ruby and Rake and RSpec and stuff like that and then just make it work that way. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. It's open source. Um, if you're on Ubuntu or Debian, you can actually get a, a deb package that will install it and run it on port 8080. And then um, you just set up your Apache to uh, proxy over to the right port, and you're good to go. And all the instructions are on their website on how to do that. Um, and then you can actually set permissions for the different jobs. So for me, where I have several clients that are all using the same CI machine, um, I just set each client up with access to the proper um, project reports. And then um, my developers, my subcontractors, um, get access to just the ones that they're working on at the moment. So nice. Uh, it's got some nice access control and stuff built into it. And I, I really haven't had any problems with it. It runs on Java, which is just something to be aware of. Um, but I've only really had problems with Jenkins. Um, being Java when it ran out of it, it pre-allocates basically it pre-allocates memory space for itself and I've had it run out of memory space because I had a, a really large test suite or something like that um, something in the build process you know sucked up more memory than Jenkins allocated to itself and mm. so what you do is you just give it different flags um, you just use the flags to say okay well just you know grab twice as much memory or something and then it works fine so um, been pretty happy with it. I've run Jenkins on Mac OS and on Linux and, uh, it, it's happy in either place. Um, another, another one that, that comes up sometimes is, uh, uh, source, co source control management. What SCM do you use? Uh, so subversion or Git. Subversion Those or are, Git. Yeah. Yep. I'm spoiled on Git. I can't use subversion anymore. Really? Yeah. You know, I've been using Git really heavily for the past couple of months, and I, I've asked this question several times to some of the other developers, especially some of the ones that I pair with, and he's like, okay, well, we need to roll back versions. Crap, how do you do that? And then he spends five minutes looking up commands on how to roll back one particular file or something, and I always I said to him several times, how is it that Git got so popular? You know? What, it's a very roll, powerful thing. Yeah. Oh, it, it's not that hard. You just have to know the hash for the version you want to roll back to. Yeah, I know. There's, it's a lot. It's the easy things. I mean, this is these are people that have been using Git for a while too. Mm -hmm. they, it's easy commands. Or if you don't use them a lot, are are easy to lose because it's all a uh, command line. Yeah, there you are know? there are different uh, tools out there. GitHub has a Git tool that you can get, it, especially if you're hosting with them. It makes it really easy because you can manage all kinds of stuff with it. Right, and we we've seen we've. We have that tool uh, uh, where we use it at, and it's it's. I've, my understanding is they after using it for a short while, it just didn't cut it. Yeah, it, it it is still missing some features. I haven't used it for a while. I'm pretty happy with the command line. Right, um, but uh, it just seems like uh, Git um, is very powerful. Like I actually, I told one of the guys uh, that. It, we were comparing Git to TFS, which again, if you're using again for those who are actually using TFS, you're using the wrong tool. <laughs> <laughs> TFS does source control as well. Uh, um, Git is like juggling chainsaws while you're nude. <laughs> it's very powerful. Uh, yeah, you you could use lose an arm or yeah. something else. <laughs> you, is you, that you what you're saying? You could lose an appendage if you're if you don't pay attention to what you're doing. Whereas um, TFS was like trying to juggle while wearing a straitjacket and be being trapped inside of a coffin. Oh, jeez. 
it, it, you, you can't do anything, right? You just you can't even get your job done. So um, I mean, I, I like Subversion. If I was just going to do a plain, uh, simple project that didn't have any um, real heavy branching requirements, I'd probably use Subversion just because it's what what Subversion is hard to do is do the really hard things like merging and branching, mm-hmm. right? It gets hard there, but all the easy stuff is very easy, and an idiot can learn it in three seconds. Git seems to be weighted the other way. It's a little bit harder to pick up and just do the basics, but the hard stuff is actually a ton easier than it is in other tools. So, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I learned Subversion first, and then I moved over to Git, and Git is really... It, it really is my weapon of choice. I mean, it just... For for me anyway, it just makes things a whole lot easier. But I'm I'm branching and merging and you know managing crap all the time, and so you know all of the things that Git does well are things that I actually need on a regular basis. So, right. Um, the other question I have for you is, what software do you use to actually manage the project? So stories, tasks, what have you. So um, right now we're using a tool that uh, this is the first time I've used it. That I've been really impressed with, and it's called. Um, Zenboard. Zenboard. Yeah, I'm, let me just pull that up and make sure I'm telling you right. Yeah, Zenboard. I feel I'll, the I'll put Zen. A link. Yeah, <laughs> I'll put a link uh, to that. It, it's a really cool, just very simple. Uh, lets you list your stories and um, organize them. Uh, I, I really liked using that, but in the past I've used um, Rally's tool. What, what did you think of Rally's tool? Sorry, sorry, and I when I said Zen, it's Agile Zen, and it. So I'm going to put a link in there. What do I think of uh, Rally's tool? Uh huh. Um, I think that they were really targeting enterprises. So for a small shop development, um, it was kind of an overloaded tool. Yeah, I. I- I looked at the rally. Um, I'm just going to look it up here so I can put a link in the show notes for that as well. Um, but uh, they, for me, it was it was so overkill. Um, it didn't seem to be simple to do anything with it, <laughs> and so uh, it really turned me off that way. But I know a lot of people that use it and really like it. So um, I'm probably just not in the, you know, in their target demographic maybe it right. is more enterprise um i use pivotal tracker to keep track of my stuff hmm. you like that i do like that i have a few concerns but it's more with the company than with the the software itself um pivotal labs was purchased by emc corporation um as was one of my former employers and uh i I just I didn't really I wasn't really impressed with the way that they manage some of their acquisitions, and so I'm a little bit worried about where Pivotal Tracker will go as they continue to manage Pivotal Labs. Um, and and who knows I mean it, it sounds like they've been somewhat hands off and so maybe things will continue to go well I just don't know. Um, but acquisitions always kind of frighten me a little bit when they acquire a tool that I'm using. Um, I do know a lot of people in the Ruby community. And in other areas, actually, you know, .NET shops and stuff use Redmine or Chili Project, which is a branch of Redmine. <laughs> um, and those are open source, so um, you can check that out at redmine.org. Um, but yeah, so far it's been Pivotal Tracker, and I've been pretty happy with it. So, um, so the to um, go back on what I said just a little bit the one thing that TFS actually does pretty decent is story tracking and uh, issue tracking mm-hmm. so I've used TFS in the in the past for that and they actually did they actually f- built a fairly decent tool around that but I'd say if you're a shop that uh, does on-site development doesn't do a lot of remote development I think the best tool by far to use is a physical board I think that uh, the electronic boards just don't cut it there's a big difference. There's just a lot of things you get out of using a physical board for tracking your, keeping track of your stories and using physical artifacts. And a lot of people overlook that because we're technologists and we look for technology to solve every problem that we've got. And, hey, what if I'm, you know, on the golf course and I really want to see the status of a story? So we need to have it in an electronic format that I can access on my phone. And, you know, we're kind of 
over we're, we're going after features we really don't need mm-hmm. you know i'd be happy if i could get a, a spreadsheet like program like excel uh, which i've used a lot in the past to track tasks just to do a little bit better job at keeping track of notes yeah if, if it would do that i'd use that for most of the development that i do you know at least for small shop stuff a couple three guys I would use something like that if I had to use an electronic tool. If not, I'd use a physical artifact because there's just there isn't a replacement for using physical boards and physical artifacts. You lose so much when you go to an electronic, an electronic one. Right. So um, one other thing that I've, I've used on different teams is having an IRC channel or an IRC chat or something mm. like that. Have you have you used anything like that? So um, I've used Yammer. Um, you know, kind of a, a similar vein at least. And Yammer is actually really awesome. I've really enjoyed Yammer and found a lot of benefit out of using that. Um, didn't I think Microsoft just bought it, didn't they? Yes, they just bought it. I really like Yammer as well. Um, hopefully, you know, like I said, it, it's the same thing with acquisitions kind of, you know, makes me worry a little bit. But, you know, hopefully... Hopefully things stay going the right direction with Yammer. So right, yeah, and I've I've benefited a lot from using Yammer. Um, tried to get it into some other shops uh, that were doing some offshore development to kind of increase the communication channels. Um, so I really felt like Yammer was a, a big value and a big win. Yeah, they. It was funny because uh, I I looked at them when pretty early on in their. Um, in their starting development and they were more of a Twitter type clone and it it didn't make a ton of sense to me what they had but I I had somebody recommend it again to me more recently and I went and looked at it and it they've really figured it out they've got it nailed down and it's it's a really valuable tool for communicating um, with other people in your organization and you know maybe dispersed across different teams and stuff my one complaint about Yammer is their pricing. I think they're for the small shops, you know, sub twenty people that they're that who are also probably price sensitive. Mm-hmm. That their price offering is uh, kind of out of whack. Yeah, I can see that. But uh, I really like them. I've also used Campfire, which is a thirty-seven signals. Yep. It's more of a chat thing again. Um, but. Uh, you know it's it's really it's really kind of a cool tool and uh you know you can get bots to put in the different channels and you know and you can get different information out of them things like that and so um i know that uh that github uses one that they wrote called hubot that that you know again just provides them with a lot of information and they've actually uh hooked up some arduino boards to their office door and stuff and so you can tell hubot to open the door and it'll open the door um, and things like that, but um, you know, just uh, you know, uh, the, it's kind of a different approach from Yammer, where Yammer is more of a, a social messaging, and the IRC and Campfire more of um, more of a chat, more of an IM, and uh, you know, so whatever works for your organization, right, right. Well, I can't think of any other classes of tools that really affect uh, team management or um, development practices or anything. It, it, so one I'd like to cover really briefly, it would be training. Training. Good one. Yeah. I've, I've been paying for my uh, Pluralsight subscription for uh, a couple of years now. And to me, that's definitely a tool of choice. That along with, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that I just feel like I can't live without. And so... Um, for training, for me, the big win was when I discovered Pluralsight. It really cut down on my budget on buying books, mm-hmm. and they're pretty topical. Um, they're drifting a- away from the Microsoft Center now and coming out with a lot more widespread. You know, they've got a lot of um, JavaScript courses that they're publishing. So that was a big one for me was uh, Pluralsight, which is also a personal plug since I work yeah. for. Them. Yep, um, I'm actually working on a course for them as well. So, um, you know, and and I've looked through their their offering, and there's a lot there. Um, another one that's pretty popular, um, but they they they're more uh, general is Lynda.com. 
Right. Um, and, and they have videos on programming. They have videos on all kinds of stuff. Right. Linda tends to stick t- more towards the introductory level stuff. Um, right. So. And Pluralsight's not afraid to get into the deep corners right. of, of things. Right. And, and I, I've learned whenever I have to learn a new topic, like I was learning, I had to pick up Angular. So one of the places I love to go is YouTube and find Angular videos or find videos about the topic I'm learning. So I'm, I was watching Angular videos. And one of the frustrating things about YouTube is just the quality of the videos varies so much. You can get one video that's great and another one that's terrible. And, and the topics, when they, you know, you look at the video and they list what the topics are and you get into the video, it turns out it wasn't really at all about that. And so it's really hard. You have to wade through a lot to find quality videos where if you go to a service like Plural, specifically Plural Site, you know exactly what you're getting. You know exactly what the course is about. You can see the outline and jump around. And there's just, there's just a big difference to having that curated, um, cared for content for looking at stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely. Like things. Yeah. Yeah. I, and then that's one thing that's really nice is that, uh, yeah, the plural site and Linda, I know both, um, you know, they screen their authors and make sure that their, their quality is there. And then, um, as they're producing the modules for their video, uh, courses, again, they, they're, they're making sure that every step of the way things are, up to that level and so that's that's really nice but but there definitely are some good videos on youtube that are free and uh you know good places to look and and you can also just you know talk to users groups and people that you know that seem to have more expertise than you and find out where they get their training where they learn certain things and and then that's been very helpful for me because then i've been referred to other websites that have the content that i want that uh you know i don't have to go hunt it down absolutely for developers out there i mean I, it probably wasn't until about two years ago that I really made the shift. But for developers out there that don't turn to a video first, I would highly recommend that you st- start getting in the habit when you need to learn something new. Look for videos first. They're just a lot more effective than reading articles or books. Yeah, yeah you get to see it in action, which is really nice. Absolutely. So, All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, do you have any picks for this week? Yeah, um, so a couple of picks. Um, the... There's a series of novels published about, um, they're actually novelettes, and you can get them for, I think, a buck through Kindle a piece. And they're the Derek Storm novels. And uh, if, you're, if anybody's familiar with the show Castle, uh, they are written by the, char- the fictional character who is the central character of the show Castle. So they've produced a couple, like three books now, and then now these novelettes about Derek Storm. And the second one is just out, and the third one, it's a trilogy is going to be out later on this August and they're fantastic, really good books. Kind of like, uh, um, born identity, very similar to born identity type stuff. And so the Derek storm novels, you can get them on Kindle for a buck. Awesome. And then the other one, the other, my other pick is a brand new, uh, board game that just came out called dungeon command. It's a D and D board game. And it's a, it's a tactical head to head game with miniatures but it's not collectible miniatures, so you don't have to spend a ton of money on it. And then if you buy the pieces, they're compatible with the Dungeons & Dragons board games that are dungeon crawler ones, Drizzt and Castle Ravenloft and Wrath of Ashardalon. So you can actually use some of the pieces from this uh, new Dungeon Command uh, game in, the, um, in your other board games. So those are pretty cool. Sounds like fun. I played D&D way back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I'm too busy to play D&D, but I'm not too busy to play the board games. Huh, I'll have to check it out. So my picks this week, um, since I mentioned podcasts or what I listen to, I'm going to mention a few. Um, one of them is the Wide Teams podcast that's put out by Avdi Grimm. Um, he's actually on the Ruby Rogues podcast. And uh, if, you, if you're a remote worker or work on a remote team, um, then Wide Teams is actually a really terrific resource. Um... Another one that I really enjoy is Stuff You Should Know, and that's um, put out by the folks at HowStuffWorks.com, I think. And uh, they cover all kinds of stuff. So they've talked about lightning. They've talked about, I mean, all sto- all, all sorts of interesting stuff. The one that I have in my queue right now is How Disco Works. So <laughs> it, should, it should be interesting to listen to. Um, another one that I really like is uh, it, it's put out by a podcast network called SQPN. Um, and that's a network. It's actually run by a Catholic priest. Um, but he, he and another, um, J.R.R. Tolkien, Tolkien, um, expert, 
um, put out a weekly podcast or semi-weekly podcast called um, Secrets of the Hobbit. And so they go over all of the news on the video on the movies that are coming out. And then they talk about like different aspects of the world of um, of the Lord of the Rings. And, and that one is just really, really interesting, really fun to listen to. Um, you know, and uh, it's not really heavy on the religious stuff. He does mention sometimes the you know, some of the um, some of the principles, some of the things that J.R.R. Tolkien might have been um, influenced by with his Catholic faith. But 99 percent of it is just about. Um, about the Hobbit and about the movies, and it's just it's really fun to listen to some of the stuff that they find out there, and so they they talk about pictures that they found, videos that they found, and things like that. Hmm. And uh, so it's a really cool one. And then I'm just going to plug one more. It's called Prenercast, and uh, I actually have their 62nd episode in my queue. Um, they talk about things related to entrepreneurship and running a business, internet marketing, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, um, then, then you can go pick that up as well. And, and, uh, anyway, those, those are my picks this week. And, uh, I, I should plug one final thing since I really can't move today. Um, I did the first workout from P90X. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a 90 day workout regimen deal. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I did, um, chest and back and now I can't move my chest or back (laughs) or arms for that matter. But anyway, um, that's quite the workout. So I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know that we have any announcements. Um, 